Okay, our, uh, our next speaker is uh, Jose Calderon Infante, who will be telling us about the convex hull swampland distant conjecture and bounds on non geodesics. Take it away, Jose. Okay, so first of all, let me thank to Cody and to John for organizing this seminar series. I think it's a really good initiative, so, so thanks to them. And today I wanted to talk to you about this work done in collaboration with my PhD advisor, Angel, and with Irene Valenzuela. And let me start with the basics, which is a lightning review of the Swamp Land Program. So the Swamp Land Program, in my opinion, comes from a maybe apparently a question, and is that we are asking, all or, are all effective field theories, I mean weakly coupled to Einstein gravity, consistent with quantum gravity? We believe the answer is no, and therefore we define the Swamp Land as those apparently consistent theories that uh, cannot be completed to quantum gravity. And the aim of the program is to find those constraints that the theories need to satisfy in order not to belong to the swamp plan. I think this is nicely codified in this, uh, in this picture in which we have a huge landscape, but we believe there is an even more large swamp land. And also this, uh, yeah, we want to find these swamp land constraints that we expect to get more constraining when we go up in energy and maybe even finding a, a unique theory of quantum gravity of some energy, for example, string theory. The progress in this program up to this moment is uh, as a web of some blank conjectures. We have some of them. I only put here some of them. Sorry for the ones that I'm missing. And the most important thing, at least to me, is that they are connected. So they are not isolated conjectures, but they are actually forming a web. Uh, for reviews, please look at these references. Now, today we are going to focus on the distance conjecture. So let me introduce it. Uh, it, it is about the modular space of the theory. And it is telling us that whenever you go to infinite distance in this modular space, you will always find an infinite tower of massless states that are becoming massless exponentially with the distance when the distance is going to infinity. By the way, I'm taking here Planck units. Also, we have the expectation that this alpha is always going to be bigger than at least some order one factor in Planck units. Now, why do we, do we believe this? Basically, because of the lot of evidence that we have. Uh, mainly all of them comes from string theory, and I left here only a couple of references. Sorry for the ones that I'm missing again. And also recently, there has been some uh, evidence in the context of ADS-CFT considered in these two papers. Now, for my talk, it's going to be important to remark these two key points about the Swamland distance conjecture. First, that delta is the geodesic distance, and therefore we are considering actually geodesics. This curve here is a geodesic. Second, that even though strictly speaking, the Swamland distance conjecture is about the modular space, so we are talking about uh, uh, modular space that is parameterized by exactly massless scalars, on physical grounds, we expect this conjecture to be true as long as we are at some energy scale in which some scalars are sufficiently massless. So this equation here, this is what we call in the paper a pseudo modular space. Now, importantly, if we consider these two things together, so if we consider geodesics in a pseudo-modular space, we are going to end up concluding that the Swamland distance conjecture puts constraints on potentials, which is a nice conclusion. How it goes? So consider a theory with some scalars space, and now we have potential in such a way that some scalars become heavy. They are here at this scale. So if I go up in energies, so here in the UV, they are going to still be uh, almost massless to my view, and I will call pseudo-modular space all the scalars space. Now, if I go down in energy, at some point, I will be able to integrate out these heavy scalars, and my pseudo-modular space will change to some m bar. Now, what is important here is to notice that geodesics of m bar are not necessarily geodesics of m. Actually, for generic potentials, they are not. Therefore, we have to ask ourselves the following question. Could be the Swamland distance conjecture satisfied in m are still violated in M bar? There are, of course, two answers. Yes, and if it is so, it must happen that the Swamland distance conjecture stops making sense as a Swamland constraint in the IR. I mean, you could go to the IR, you could have a pseudo modular space that is not satisfying the Swamland distance conjecture, and yet you will say, this is okay, I only need to go up in energies, so I will find some scalar that I must integrate in, and uh, it will complete the pseudo modular space to something that will fulfill the Swamland distance conjecture. Okay, this could be the case, but we prefer to think that actually this cannot happen. And if this cannot happen, then the Swamland distance conjecture should put constraint on potentials in such a way that this indeed does not happen. Because again, for generic potentials, this will happen. 
So as a summary of this part, of this part consistency of the swampland distance conjecture along the RG flow means that it has to put constraints on potentials. Now, the following question is, which kind of constraints? This is sort of easy to say, because one can say, OK, what has to happen is that all mod flat valleys of the potential should be geodesic enough. But what do we mean with geodesic enough? In order to find out, let us consider the interplay between the swamland distance conjecture being realized for geodesics and non-geodesic trajectories. OK, so outline of the talk. First, I will consider these non-geodesic bounds in the hyperbolic plane. Then I will generalize it by giving a new geometric formulation of the Schoenland Vista conjecture. Later, I will uh, recast it in a new convex house Schoenland Vista conjecture that we propose. And finally, I will talk just a bit about constraint of the potential and asymptotic flux compactification, and I will draw some conclusions. So let's start with the hyperbolic plane. So let me consider the upper half plane with this metric that I call the hyperbolic plane. And why it is interesting to consider this very specific example? Basically, because it happens any time in string theory. Actually, to my knowledge, it happens in any of the realizations that we know for the Swamland distance conjecture in string theory and also in the ads cft ones. I'm going to call all the time this the saxion and this the axions as a reference to Calabi-Yau modular space. However, I'm not assuming that they are such a saxion and axion. I only assume in this form of the metric, OK? So first thing, we want the Swamland distance conjecture to be realized for geodesics. And therefore, we need to, to, knew the, 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 to know the form of the geodesics. Turns out geodesics are vertical lines or these circumferences. So we learned that if you want to go to infinite geodesic distance, you need to take S, the saxion, to 0 to infinity. Let us choose infinity just for definiteness. And the axion is going to go to a constant. This is going to be really important later, by the way. Now, if you plug this, you are going to find that the geodesic distance behave logarithmically with this axiom. And we want to, if you want to satisfy the Swamland distance conjecture for geodesics, you only need to do, as happens in string theory, that you have some tower of states, which is polynomially falling with this axiom when it goes to infinity. And therefore, it does exponentially with the distance. And you can read off this alpha for the geodesics to be a over n in the parametrization I choose. So, uh, Usually in string theory, these both numbers are order one, and you find that expected that this is an order one parameter. Now, our aim was to, now that the Swanland distance conjecture is satisfied for geodesics, to consider non geodesics. So let me consider now a trajectory, which is just the axion doing things while this axion is going to infinity, and let's see what we can do. It turns out that you can classify these trajectories according to the Swanland distance conjecture in three, in three cases. You can talk about asymptotically geodesic case, which is the one in this f prime goes to zero, and you just find that the Swanland distance conjecture is perfectly satisfied with alpha being the alpha of a geodesic. You can also consider this critical case in which f prime is going to a constant, and it turns out that in this case, you get a non zero alpha, so the Swanland distance conjecture could survive depending on how large you want this alpha to be. But the thing is that this is always smaller than alpha of the geodesic. So this is kind of a Dangerous one, but it's still okay. And finally, you have the swampy case, which is the case in whenever this f prime goes to infinity, and you find that alpha goes to zero, and the swampland distance conjecture is violated. We could actually call this one will be the essentially geodesic case, as we are going to see next. These are the ones that I that I said that are geodesic enough, and these ones are just too non-geodesic. Okay, this is nice, but we want to quantify this as by something that measures how non-geodesic are the trajectories. We can find a good candidate to be the modulus of the proper acceleration, since being geodesic means that this proper acceleration has to vanish. We can do this, and we can find that, indeed, the asymptotically geodesic case has vanishing proper acceleration in the limit. The critical case in which it goes to some value that depends on the beta that I said before, and you can rewrite see this factor that we call nu that is comparing the alpha of the geodesic for, with the alpha of the non-geodesic, and you can write it in this way. So only in terms of the non-geodesic. So you are measuring how much the Swan Ladista conjecture is in danger in terms of how non-geodesic is the trajectory, which, which was our aim. And also the swampy case in which the proper acceleration reached uh, a maximum. And as I said, the Swan Ladista conjecture is violated. Now this is nice. This is what we wanted, but we have a problem. 
and is that a criterion based only on this modulus of the proper acceleration cannot be generalized beyond the hyperbolic plane. Why? Let me sketch it. If you consider the product of different hyperbolic planes, you can take one of these axioms to infinity, and now you can consider general trajectories in the different axioms. Turns out that when you consider to wind in different axioms, you get different relations between this modulus of the proper acceleration and the factor nu. And that means that there won't be a formula that is encoding movement in all the axioms at the same time. You need to specify which axiom you want to move. Therefore, it seems that we need information about the direction of this vector. And this is not good because this can get really difficult at any time. So is this the end of the story? Luckily, it is not. So let's move to the next section in which we are able to generalize this by giving a geometric formulation of the Swann and distance conjecture. Here, I put the master equation, since this is just a rewriting of the alpha parameter of the Swann and distance conjecture in these terms. And we are going to extract almost all the information from it. The first thing that we realize is that the Swann and distance conjecture only cares about the unit tangent vector. There is no notion of curvature here. The Swann and distance conjecture, I mean the alpha, does not care about this t being of a geodesic, of a non-geodesic, doesn't care. But then one should ask, where is the information about being geodesic? We have said that the Swann Lattice conjecture has to be satisfied for geodesics. In order to find out, let us consider again the previous example. We saw that geodesics were of this kind. So for example, this is never a geodesic. What we are seeing here is that saying that a tangent vector has to be asymptotically geodesic means that the component along the axiom direction of the tangent vector has to vanish. This means that not all tangent vectors are allowed for geodesically going to infinite distance. And therefore, what is the information about being geodesic? It's just a restriction about all the tangent vectors to which we are going to apply this formula. We are going to apply the Swamland distance conjecture. It's just a restriction in the set of tangent vectors that we have to consider. Therefore, we define such subset of tangent vectors as G being the subspace spanned by all these asymptotically geodesic tangent vectors. Very good. Next question, what is the information of the towers? This one is easier because it is here. It is in the gradient log m vector of the towers. So you, you can define a similar subspace m. It is the one spanned by all these gradient log m vectors for the towers. With these techniques, we can already give a geometric formulation of what I like to call the my Swann Lattista conjecture. Let me rewrite again our master equation in this form. We find that this is nothing but the projection of the, grand, of the gradient vector into the direction of the tangent vector. Therefore, if you want to, to state that the Swann Lattista conjecture realized for some alpha bigger than zero, it can be parametrically small. This is why I call it the mild Swann Lattista conjecture. You find that it is uh, equivalent to saying that the projection of M onto G should completely fill G. Put it in words, for any direction in G, there must be at least a tower with non-orthogonal gradient log vector. We learn from this statement two things. First, that we need at least the same nine, uh, number of towers as orthogonal ways of approaching infinite distance. And second, that this resembles a sort of completeness hypothesis in which G is the space of charges. This is going to be inspired later. Okay, this is nice, but we want to formulate the actual on la vista conjecture with this alpha being bigger than some or the one parameter. In order to do that, let's rewrite again the master equation in this way, now considering the angle between the two vectors. If you want this alpha to be bigger or equal than some alpha zero that we expect to be order one, you find that the cosine of this angle has to be smaller than some. This basically means that each tower defines a cone of directions that is satisfying, that are satisfying the, uh, the, the Swamland distance conjecture. And therefore, it is just trivial to say that the Swamland distance conjecture takes the form of G being included in some subset of directions, T, in which we put all the directions that are OK with the Swamland distance conjecture, which is a trivial statement. The thing is that we are able to construct this subset of directions as the union of the different cones generated by the different towers. So something that you could find is something like this. You have an infinite distance limit, and you can approach it in all these tangent vectors, in two different tangent vectors and combinations. You can have these two towers, they are spanning these two cones, and whatever is inside is okay, whatever is outside is not okay. Notice that here I don't give information about geodesics. It could be the case that only this line here is corresponding to geodesic tangent vectors, and that will mean that the Swann distance conjecture is actually satisfied for geodesic. But we find that there are non geodesics for which it is not satisfied. Now, 
ah, later we are going to see how this translates to a convex hull, a la weak gravity conjecture. But first, we were caring about bounds on non geodesic, so let's go for it. And the first thing that we have bad news, and is that as we have just seen, uh, more non geodesic does not mean that alpha is going to decrease. Basically, you could have a highly non geodesic trajectory, but still a tower there. So the information about, about alpha is in the towers, not in being geodesic or not. Again, being geodesic is just a restriction on the tangent vectors. So in general, there is no such a nice relation between being more, no, no, more non geodesic and alpha being smaller, unless you ask the, the, the modular space to fulfill this stronger condition, condition, which is the condition that says that all towers are precisely aligned with geodesic directions. And actually, this is what we, what we were intuitively assuming in the previous examples. And it is the case, as long as I know, in all the string theory examples. Now, if this is true, we can take again our master equation. We can divide it in the contribution of m and the orthogonal complement of m that has to go to 0. And now, if this is true, we can trade m by g. And now we have here the contraction of a tangent vector that belongs to g. So up to the modulus of this vector, this is nothing but alpha for the geodesic. So this is this equation. Now, luckily, now we are able to write this factor that we were using for measuring how the swam vista conjecture is put into danger when you go non geodesically in terms of basically this, this norm of the projection of the tangent vector into the space G. You can also write in terms of the orthogonal complement. And now we get this form, which is more uh, reminding to the one that we had before, in which this was just substituted by n square modulus of omega square. Importantly, there is no assumption on the form of the metric here. I'm not assuming anything about the metric. I'm just assuming that I'm able to compute the subspace G and that M is equal to G. This is the only thing that I am assuming here. Now, let's move into a sort of different thing, jet related, which is the convex hull from land distance conjecture. We are going to build it by analogy with weak gravity conjecture quantities. So first, let me uh, define the scalar charge to ratio, which is similar to what Alti and Palti did in his scalar weak gravity conjecture paper in this way. Well, here we recognize this to be sort of the gauge couplings. I said gauge because the, this is not a gauge interaction. And this to be the quantized charge, which is not quantized. So this is just in analogy with the weak gravity conjecture. So this is sort of a scalar charge to mass ratio. If writing this in this way, we can at least we can at last rewrite for the next for the last time this alpha. In, as in this way, where now we have this vector n, which is nothing but the vector t, the tangent vector of the trajectory, but now with this factor g, which is nothing that a matrix that gets squared to the metric in modular space. And importantly, this thing here now is just a Cartesian product. Why? Because actually the thing that we have done here, mathematically speaking, is moving from the, from the coordinate frame in the tangent plane to the uh, orthonormal one, to orthonormal one. So this explains why we have here a Cartesian product. Now we also need a notion of extremality. What is extremality in this sense? It is marginally satisfying the Swamland distance conjecture. So we are going to impose that this n times z is equal to alpha zero. Notice that it defines an extremal hyperplane for its direction. This is nothing but the equation of a hyperplane at a distance alpha zero from the origin. And if you consider all the directions at the same time, this is drawing for you a spherical extremal region with radius alpha c, as I draw here. Each direction has this extremal plane, and you need towers to be above it. And if you consider all of them, you have this spherical region. Now, with these ingredients, we can already state the convex Swanland distance conjecture as saying that satisfying the Swanland distance conjecture for all trajectories is completely equivalent to having the convex hull of this of the different scalar charge to mass ratio to contain the ball of radius alpha zero. Let me put an example. One can have this, uh, the following situation. You have, again, an infinite distance limit. You can approach it in all these ways. And it turns out that you draw the convex hull of the towers. And you see here that the Swan delta conjecture is not satisfied for any directions. Then there are mainly two options. First, that the Swan delta conjecture should be satisfied that everything here is geodesic. 
is going geodesic to the infinite distance. Then you have missing towers. And from here, you can see that a tower around here will actually make the game for you. And you can satisfy the Swan Lambista conjecture. You can search for that tower. The other possibility is that actually this direction here is not a geodesic one. So the Swan Lambista conjecture is real, is satisfied here, but you can forbid directions for the potential to be almost flat directions. You can draw these two lines that are giving you exactly the directions that are swampy, the ones that are not realizing the swamp land distance conjecture and that should be forbidden at low energies when you include a potential. Okay, I'm almost finishing and I want to consider now constraints of the potential and asymptotic flux compatification. I'm going to be brief. Uh, we consider M theory on Calabella four folds with G4 fluxes near infinite distance was done in this paper. And let me just take two messages. First, that when you go to infinite distance, the metric takes this form usually, which is just a hyperbolic plane as we were working at the beginning and a part that is not driving infinite distance. And second, that they show in this paper that the potential have this homogeneity property. And when you compute, the, you impose that this action is at its vacuum, you find this pack reaction when you move in the action. So basically, thanks to the, this property, it is true that whenever you displace the action, this action is going to be back reacted linearly. Now, if you put these two things together, you see that this is nothing but a critical trajectory, as the ones that we were considering in the very beginning for the hyperbolic plane. Therefore, we see that actually string theory potentials are realizing these critical trajectories. Let me remind, these are non-geodesic, but are still compatible with the Swamland distance conjecture. And we take this as evidence for our proposal of the Swanland distance conjecture giving constraints in the potential. Okay, let me conclude. So we have argued that consistency of the Swanland distance conjecture along the RG flow means that it has to put uh, constraints on potentials. So it is an even more powerful conjecture that one could have thought in the beginning. We have considered a hyperbolic plane. We have characterized the critical tra trajectories that are non-geodesic, but still compatible with the Swamland distance conjecture. And we have checked that they, they are actually realized in a string theory. Then we have been able to give a new geometric reformulation of the Swamland distance conjecture that allows us to generalize the previous criterion to completely general cases, as long as you are able to find out the relevant information. Finally, we have translated this geometric formulation into a convex hull swamp land distance conjecture that we have shown to be a really nice tool for studying both the swamp land distance conjecture and the uh, bounds on non-geodesics, and that also strengthened this connection between the swamp land distance conjecture and some tower with gravity conjecture that was already noticed in these two references. Let me now really finish with two questions. First, uh, could we get general constraints or properties of the potentials that are coming from this uh, consistency of the swan land distance conjecture? And second, could we get some further understanding of the extremal region for the convex hull swan land distance conjecture? It would be nice. So thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you, Jose, for the very nice talk. Let us all thank Jose with our uh, clap emojis. Uh, the first question is from Miguel. Hi, Jose. Very nice, thanks. So, uh, so, so the question I had, so basically what you do, you start with some metric, then you put a potential, and then you basically are putting restrictions on, on the values of the potentials that are carved out with the same metric, right? Precise. Yeah, so, 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 so what I wonder is, could it be that the, that the UV and IR metrics change? So, you know, when you're at the bottom, at the, at the bottom, at the, you know, low in the potential, uh, you're integrating out some states, and in particular, you could be integrating out a lot of uh, uh, you know massive states, particularly close to infinite distance points. So I'm just wondering, I'm just asking how 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 much can we change? Can the can the metric itself change as you go from the UV to the IR? And I guess that the that the answer also depends a bit of on how much supersymmetry you have. So this is a really good question, actually. And so my answer is that it could be the case, and um, maybe it's actually the case. But now notice that at the very end of the of the of this talk, the information about the being geodesic it's only as a restriction of the tangent uh, the tangent vectors, and a direction going from being geodesic to non geodesic is actually something pretty dramatic. It's not a, a small change in the metric. It's something that was diverging and now is not diverging anymore. 
So it's, for example, if you consider the hyperbolic plane, you have this, if you normalize this action, you have that the action has some exponential of minus the, this action. So you will need to get rid of this in order to change being geodesic or not. Then, of course, you mean asymptotically, right? Asymptotically geodesic. Exactly, asymptotically geodesic. It is important that geodesic, being geodesic or not, it's the fact that it is non-trivial has to be to go to infinite distance. So if you are in a regular point in the manifold, there is a geodesic for any direction. So it is something about going to infinite distance. All right. Um, okay, thanks. Okay, are there any further questions? Okay, if not, uh, let us thank both Jose and Federico again for their uh, excellent talks. Thank you very much. Uh, I really enjoyed them. And